Okay, gentlemen, we left off at Matthew 21. Getting near the end of the book here. Okay, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go to the village opposite you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, set him on them, and a very great multitude spread their garments on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he'd come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So obviously we understand this is his triumphal entry. This was Palm Sunday. And it's interesting how... <laughs> you got to figure the disciples really didn't catch on much to a lot going on. I mean, here he is now. He's telling them exactly what's going to happen. You know, you're going to go here. You're going to find this. They're going to give you permission. So he knows this ahead of time. But we still find out later on that they, st they still don't get it. <laughs> you know, that he, he knows these things ahead of time. So they do. They follow it. They put him on the, on the colt. They're right into Jerusalem. And people are saying, who is this man? And the response is, this is Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, pick it up, 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Then he left them, went out to the city of Bethany, and lodged there. So obviously, again, the priest, you know, they're just very upset with him, okay? Number one, they're calling him out as the son of David, which he Messiah, and they're getting a little bit upset with him. Now, in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said, let no fruit grow on the you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. Now, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, do not doubt. You will be able to do what was done to the fig tree. But also, if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. All things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, when he came to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching. They said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise would tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? If we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So he, he, he's kind of playing their game with them. They want to know, basically, this, this is the stupidity of religious leaders. What gives you the right to heal people? Now, whose authority do you have? They said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you where my authority comes from if you answer the one question about John the Baptist. And they, they, they couldn't do that because no matter what their answer was, they didn't deep doo-doo. And so Jesus said, okay, I'm not answering you either. He <laughs> kind of walks away. 28. What do you think? A 
man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first. And Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots entered the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in a way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. And so, again, he's playing their game, playing the stories back to them. Who do you think, believe, who's think going to heaven, who's not? Basically, he told them, you're not going to heaven. He says, harlots, tax collectors, you know, the worst of all people are going to make it before you guys do. Any comments or questions on that? He talked on the mic yesterday. He said, Mike, we're not gonna we're gonna get a little further today because you're not here to ask all these questions. <laughs> he said, Yeah, I know. By the time I get back, it'll be the end of Mark. <laughs> okay, 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. He leased it to the vine dressers and went to the far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. They did likewise to them. But last of all, he sent his son, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine dressers? I understand the parable. Usually this is a parable of himself, yet they don't understand it. And he said to them, they said to him, answering back to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits of their seasons. And Jesus said, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, and whomever it falls, it will grind into powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived, <laughs> they perceived he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Now Jesus basically now is just being point blank with them, letting them know they're not going to get into the kingdom. You know, they're not, not at all. And suddenly it dawned on them that he was actually talking about them. But they couldn't do anything about it because now they're afraid of all the crowds. So you notice that the, towards the end of here, just before he goes to the cross, his teachings and parables are getting a little more, a little stronger. He's not beating around the bush anymore. No comments? Okay, 22. Jesus answered and spake to them again by parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, but they were not willing to come. And again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready. But those who were invited are not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you can find, and bike to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, Take him away, cast him into utter darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
Any idea what this parable refers to? People that are going to or not going to heaven? Yeah, well, basically he says he's, the message is going out. Remember, Jesus is preaching to the Jews. So the parable is simply this. They're not accepting his message. So Jesus makes us listen. If you don't accept it, I'll find other people who will. And those who don't accept it will be punished. And so he sends a servant that gathers everybody in. And here's the key. All are invited, good and bad, are invited to come to the wedding feast. But if you show up and you're not properly dressed, which means you didn't prepare yourself, in a sense, to go to heaven, what happens to you? you cast out, right? Yeah, you're cast out. You go to hell. So basically, the, the meaning of the parable is, listen, everybody's invited. Everybody's invited. But you got to get ready before you come. And there's, there's several times Jesus does use the illustrations of weddings to refer to the second coming and going to heaven. Here's a great example of it, you know. Yes, I want you to come, but you get ready before you come. So as far as getting ready, is he referencing your heart, have your heart ready? Yeah. I'm sure it's not outward appearance. No, no, it's getting your heart ready, yeah. yeah. And basically it's referring to, the, to the, especially the Jewish leaders at the time. They were totally rejecting him. But he said, listen, you're still invited. Yeah. So no matter who we are, you could be an atheist. Jesus said, I still invite you to come, but you got to get ready before you come. The point is, and people say, you know, that, <laughs> In other words, God does not send anybody away. No, we separate ourselves. Yeah, he gives you and I a choice. And he sets down the rules for the entrance into heaven. And it's, if you want to go to heaven, Jesus, here, here, here's, here's the requirements. It's, it's up to you. And if you try to show up and you don't meet the requirements, you're, you're not going to get in. And that is, that is the harsh message. I mean, what about the people that... that there's, there's other cults and stuff out there that can just, they change these people's minds that, oh, it's, it's better just to have the, those people that, those, with the, these pastors with the money, you know? <laughs> um, you've got people that drive, you know, flying jets and stuff, and if you, you do it to yourself, if you can get all this money that you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. you'll get anything you want, that, that type of thing. They've, you know, I just don't understand how people, there's a lot of weak minded people out there. Oh, <laughs> you should watch the news. I mean, the world is filled with weak-minded people. Now, one of the problems today is uh, a lot of preachers uh, gravitate to those people. And a lot of our churches today have stopped preaching about heaven and hell and salvation. And you don't get salvation messages anymore. Uh, did I bring it up last week, two weeks ago? I was talking to somebody. Uh, there's an, uh, On Facebook, there's an Assemblies of God thing I'm part of. It. People make comments. And this person a couple of weeks that we could go mention in fact just prior to Halloween talking about the fact that you know youth today gravitate towards the supernatural. Right? It's every, it's, it's a every, fact. Everything today, yeah. every single thing today is and I said to D this morning, I said, everything is just getting so demonic. It, it's and it's it's not a cultural shock anymore. Yeah. People accept it more and more. It's in in it's the appearance they put up. Mm. The more evil something looks, the more kids are attracted yeah. to it today. Yeah. No, you're right. And the thing is, is that whether it's cartoons, TV programs, movies, everything is bordering almost on demonic, satanic. And people gravitate towards that. So the person brings up a valid point, which I agree with completely. She said this, you know, this is where our youth are going. Why do you suppose that is? Then she says, when's the last time you saw the supernatural in your church? Ding! And that is the problem. She says, we call ourselves Pentecostal. But where are the miracles? See, I grew up in that generation where miracles were commonplace. I mean, you never thought about the demonic. You never, I, I, I've seen demons cast out. I've seen healings, miraculous healings in our own ministry. But today we don't see it anymore. So she brought up the question, valid point. Our young people, that's the word I want to use. They're not accustomed to seeing the supernatural. They don't see it anymore. We don't have miracles anymore. 
we, we've strayed away from our foundations. And there was a study done many, many years ago about the various denominations, okay? Some of the most powerful, including Pentecostal, Bible preaching denominations were things like the Methodists, the Presbyterians. Uh, those were strong Bible preaching churches. But what it said is, by the third generation, that changes. And somebody brought this up years ago. It's, it's happening in Pentecost as well. You've got the beginnings of Pentecost, where we'll go back to the Azusa Street, back over my age of my grandparents, where the, 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 the present Pentecostal spirits poured out upon all denominations, okay? And that was carried on to the second generation, which would have been pretty much my parents and then my generation. And then after that, statistics say that it wanes because the Pentecostal message is not inherited. It has to be experienced. And the problem is it's each generation we preach it less and less and less. Like several, several, a uh, couple of years ago, people started leaving one of our AG churches and coming over here. And one of the reasons, because the pastor there will no longer preach on the Holy Spirit and use terms like being born again because they were offensive to people and he wanted to have more community church. And I asked this person, when's the last time you heard a message on the Holy Spirit? They said, never. And so we're raising a generation of Pentecostals who know nothing about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, really? Unfortunately. I mean, people being baptized in the Holy Spirit used to be a regular event. Regular event. Uh, people being healed was a regular event. Miracles were a regular event. And, and, and growing up as a child and even in my own church, watching these kids experience miracles. I mean, watching people healed watching people get filled with the Holy Spirit, seeing the gifts of the Spirit being operated in almost every service, uh, they were in contact with the supernatural. Therefore, the appeal for the supernatural outside of their church wasn't that strong because they realized, I, I could share several examples. Uh, I may have shared these stories before, but I pastored in a community that was very new age, Strong satanic witchcraft presence. presence. Uh, the former pastor warned me ahead of time. He says, once a year, they're going to send somebody to the church to curse you. And he was right. Every year, the, 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 the local satanic group would send somebody in. And every time they did, this is what, and I'd, I'd share this story after with the congregation. They would come in, and as soon as the, the, the final prayer was ushered, they would run out and wait for me, and the response was always, they'd introduce themselves, this is why I'm here. I said, I know that. They said, what you don't understand is, as soon as we enter these doors, we, we can't open our mouths, we can't look at you, we can't listen to hymns, we can't wait to get out of here. So when the people heard that, they began to realize, and, and some of them ended up getting saved. Uh, I literally, because they said, there's more power here than we had with... One of the girls that got saved, her father was one of the former pastors of the church. She got involved in a satanic movement and uh, she actually witnessed a lot of the sacrifices and all that. And when she became a Christian, they told her when she, if she gets baptized, they're gonna electrocute her. This is how bad these groups were. And I, I actually work, I work with the police out in California. I work with the state cops up in the North Shore in working with people getting out of the satanic groups. I remember taking out a, a young lady and her daughter one time because they threatened to kill her. Uh, so it was very deep. And and we would have, in fact, I'm, I'm digressing a bit, but the point is about miracles. I had a young lady just get a hold of me last month. And uh, I didn't recognize her at first until she told me her maiden name and uh, I remember she'd come to church and she was sitting there in one of the pews one time. And after the service, she came up to me, she says, Pastor, who is that person sitting behind me? I said, there was nobody sitting behind you. No, no, the person. Because they spoke to me. And I think the message basically was she needs to get her life right with God. Told her everything about her. And she got saved. She says, no, I said, no, Sandy, 
there was nobody sitting behind you. And since you realize you think it could be, and we had, we had several examples of that in the church while I was there, where people were encountering people that suddenly just disappeared. And there was one time, this honest, true, true story. The end of, we, occasionally you have these services where the Holy Spirit is so powerful. And after the, after the service, people were saying, Pastor, who are those other men on the platform with you? No, no, no. There were these big guys all around you. And see, that's what teaches people the supernatural is real. The day I had a guy come to the church to kill me, but he couldn't get in the door because he said, and I said, I said the door wasn't locked because I know that. And then he got saved. Uh, and so when the congregation hears these things, and people started coming to the church as a result of people talking about miracles. That's how the church grew. That's how we went from the building program. The building program was the basis of, of, of the miracles and the supernatural happenings. And you know what? I miss that. We don't have that anymore. And uh, I don't know what the problem was. We, we, we're so caught up in the world that we, I, I, and I have no answer. You know, I get, I get well, frustrated. I think a lot of too is, is so, they, they look at science and they ask science, does this really happen? Yeah. And the science says, no, this is the reason this happened. Yeah, so we're watching, yeah. good point. We're watching a program on History Channel the other day and they're doing a similar thing. They're going through the plagues of Egypt and they don't deny they happen. They're just explaining that. Right. Yeah. Okay, this is at this, this time of the year this is, you know, when all the, this is when the flies come out, da 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 da, and there was a drought, which meant all the frogs had no place to go to die. And the, and the, so they're explaining. Then the same thing with crossing the Red Sea. They, they they scientifically have to prove these things. They talk about Moses and the burning bush, and uh, then they go into all this all this stuff. The other day, one of the programs on the power, the supernatural power embedded in holy relics like pieces of the cross, pieces of the crown of thorns, where if you touch them, you're healed. And people do, I think, really? <laughs> and, and, but, and then you try to describe it scientifically, you know, the power of the mind. And I go, but you're right, that, that is exactly it. We, we, we tend to rely more on science. And, and when somebody is healed, it generally, well, you know, it probably would have happened anyway. Yeah. Or even know that the power of the mind, we, we, can, we can control these things. And I've heard that so much, which is why when, I've, when, when people have told me they were healed, they say cancers or heart conditions, uh, the kid that healed those deaf. And I say, go to the doctor, let the doctor tell you it's healed. And in every instance, the doctor would say, I can't explain it. Right. Yes. It's a miracle. There, these, there are things that happen we can't explain. Now you know, but people that go around complaining about their healing and whatnot, there's no proof. No, no, prove it, prove it. You know, that's the greatest proof when you tell somebody about it. Others are just going to say, no, nah, no, nah, it didn't happen. It was fake. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've witnessed too many miracles, even in my early years of ministry as youth pastor, uh, watching a girl with polio, watching her that brace come off and seeing other people healed. And uh, uh, just, and, and this is why I think we gravitate how did we get on so, that anyway? So did, you both must have heard Paul Harvey's "If I Was the Devil." Oh yeah, yeah. That's absolute. Do you ever hear that? Back in the eighties, yeah. It up. Even before that, yeah. It, it, it's powerful and it's to the point, and it's like everything yeah, it, you say. It, he does this whole monologue. If I were the devil, this is what I'd do. Yeah. And everything he says is exactly what's happening. Yeah. Everything. It, uh, it was amazing, amazing, yeah. But th and this is what bothers me: is the fact that we we it's lack, this, yeah, we, we lack the supernatural today. We really yeah. do. There is no. And I, I, I remember sitting down with Bob Wiseman, who's superintendent. I probably shared this before too when I was doing all the interim work, and he agreed with me. He says our churches have changed. We build new churches, and nobody has altar. We ripped the altar rails out of here. Uh, we don't have prayer rooms anymore. I remember when I first came here, we had a prayer room. Yeah, we had a prayer room. Yeah. Somebody would say, you always took them to the prayer room. Wow. Somebody wanted to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, at the servant, you took them to the prayer room. Uh, there was always somebody in there praying. We don't do that anymore. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, we lack seeing the supernatural. And this is why 
our young people are gravitating away from the church because what they're what they're seeing is this is real. Yeah, it's acceptable. Okay. Yeah, it's acceptable, and 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 the power is real. Okay, it's very real. And they go to church and they say, "This is boring. Well, there's nothing here for us." And quite frankly, they have a point. They really have a point. The, the less they preach about <clears throat> what we're talking about, it doesn't draw people. No. The fact is, it doesn't draw people when they stop talking about the miracles, mm. being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. It doesn't draw people anymore. And it's, it's, it's a world we think. Yeah, and uh, what the statistics show us now that the youth are not staying in our churches. Yeah. Once they leave, go to school, that's it. But I did a survey. I, I proved it in my own church. When the kids reach a certain age, I gave them all a ministry, which means I put them in a Sunday school class, work with a teacher, put them in. I mean, my, my, my daughter, Sherry, was leading the girls' ministry group. She was the leader. <laughs> she was the same age. My son, the same thing. And all the kids in the church... I plug them into a ministry. They're either in children's church, they were serving in the Sun School class, they were doing all these different things. And, and, and what I proved was when they all graduated high school, every one of them stayed in the church. Every one. Some went off to college, but when they came back, they were in a church. In fact, I got one of my youth is now in a church in Pennsylvania, and he's the Royal Ranger leader. And his sister's the same thing, but it's because. And the only thing I could think of is they had a part of the church. They had a ministry that was theirs. And it became very personal. They, they were, this is a word I want to use here. They were invested. They were involved in ministry. And a lot of it had to do with my youth pastor, uh, who was excellent at getting these kids involved in ministry. He's now been on Long Island for a little over 20 years doing a great job. Uh, but then again, that's that's what we did. We we got them involved. And today our youth are not involved. Really, they are. Yeah. A lot of our churches no longer have Sunday school classes. A lot of our churches, believe it or not, are, are not doing rangers, not doing missionaries, not doing girls, girls ministries. And I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Oh, this is when our guest speaker was here. We talked about it. Our churches are all focusing on youth ministries when the key to the church is children's ministries. I mean, think about it. If you get the child, they're young, raise them all the way up, they're not going to leave the church. But you try to get them when they're teenagers, they're already set in their ways. And statistically, they graduate with very few exceptions, they're gone. And this is something we've lost. And, uh, and I agree with this, the guy that was here speaking a couple of times, that uh, the fact that that's it, we've lost our our vision for the kids anymore. So I don't know how we got there, but where do we leave off? Anybody remember? Oh, the marriage feast? Yeah. What time have we got here? Okay, we got it. Okay, verse verse 15, okay? Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true. Yeah, <laughs> okay, they're lying right here. We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. So tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their wickedness. He said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me your tax money. So they brought to him a denarius. And he said, whose image and inscription is on this? They said, well, Caesar's. Well, then, give, therefore, to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now, good point. He's not eliminating our obligation to government. The government has certain things we owe them, but then so does God. And when they heard these words, they marveled, left him and went their way. Now, that same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second and the third, even to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died. 
Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. <laughs> I mean, they come up with the, the <laughs> stupidest illustrations. But Jesus' response, <laughs> you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures. Now, here he's getting back on these, these people that are intelligent, supposed to know the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage or are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. When the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. <laughs> he said, what's the matter with you? You don't know the Bible? It says right in the Bible, there is no marriage in heaven. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> you got to love his life. He throws things back at him. You know, there's supposed to be these these theologians, the doctors of the law, and then over and over he says, you, you, you're just stupid. You don't know your own scriptures. Verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they got together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment? Jesus said, You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. The second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, when the Pharisees are gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said, Then how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit my hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, then how is he his son? <laughs> and no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. So finally, it appears he silenced them. We're going to kind of quit right there, but uh, let me make a note here.